Uh, welcome yep. everyone to the hybrid virtual group and welcome to the Christmas special. As you all hopefully will know, we have got four brilliant lightning sessions coming up, which um, hopefully you have the details of. Um, so I'm not going to say what those are right now. We can have it as a surprise if you don't already know. And at the end of the lightning sessions, each one's going to be about 10 minutes. So we're then going to move on to our annual um, Christmas uh, quiz ball. And I don't know if I, I think I tweeted somewhere about what rounds we've got, but we've got a variety of rounds for community round, technology round, um, general knowledge round, and the infamous Christmas round in which um, I think uh, we had a knife edge decision, Mikael, didn't we, last year with the Christmas round and the uh, question about Die Hard, is it a Christmas movie or not? So we'll have something similar lined up this year so hopefully everyone can yeah because that, for that. that that question was definitely unfair since no, the only no, answer no, no. to that was yes well is yes obviously yeah um so the other thing to say is for the so we are going to be using kahoot today um i will post instructions in the chat for that i think mikhail will also post in the url to our where all our recordings will go i will tr actually try and get this christmas recording um in slightly faster time uh, than we normally do for our videos um i, I think that's it Mikel, isn't it that's all we need to know yeah well, then, uh, so. summer christmas special would make no sense uh i posted to so if you're bored during christmas holidays you can go to our hybrid virtual group in youtube message in chat and yeah i'm not going to do introduction because if you're four of you and you've been here already and we already know who you are and that you're wonderful and amazing guys and girls so let's just give it up for the first person good evening everyone so um my lightning talk is regarding pagination reports so it's it's one of the topics that I enjoy and I like I'm one of those weird people that likes pagination reports. Um for those of you that don't know me, here's a very quick introduction slide. Um I'm Laura GB. Um in other places I'm Laura Graham Brown, but in most places I'm known as Laura GB and I have a YouTube channel and a blog called Hatler Data. And I'm a data platform MVP. So paginated reports have been around for a while, but they've always been a premium feature. So one of the nice announcements that came out just recently is you no longer need that hype. You no longer need that premium capacity or that premium per user. So here I am in a standard workspace. There's no little diamond there or anything like that. And I've got my one of my favorite reports, a different topic that I do but it's, it's got much articulated data in it, but it's got weather data. The Met Office fantastically give out um, data of, of rainfall and things like that across the country. And this is the data that I use because it's available and it's public. So here's the data. We're going to create a paginated report off it really quickly and really easily because I realize I've only pretty got five minutes left. So let's get back to the workspace. I've got the data set here. I'm going to click into here. And in here, so you can go for create a paginated report. Or on this day is I'm going to go for a create a formatted table and it gives you a, a table. It's only, it's only got one visual it's a table. You can't add anything else in there for the moment. But I'm going to go for a really simple. Let's go with um, years. Let's go. So there's a whole bunch of years in there. And let's bring in our average rainfall and our average sunshine. OK, so it's yes, there's some rounding issues. Those, those measures aren't best written in the world. Um, the, the, the measures isn't, isn't rounded. It's formatted inside the Power BI report, but that doesn't come through here. So there's my table. I can on the formatting button over here, I can pick a different style. OK, so we can go for let's go for something bold and revolting. Flashy rows, that's what I meant to go for. There we go. We've got some formatting in there. OK, and then I can go up to here. I can go up to. Uh, save, give my name, uh, give my report a name. So let's call it flashy table. And let's go back in to my hybrid. And there we are. 
that is a paginated report sat in there. OK, and we can open it up and we can do the normal things we want to go through as a paginated report, such as print it, export it in all the different formats that you'd want to be able to export it. OK, if you want to edit that report, OK, and we can go to a flashy table here. And we can go on the three dots and I edit in Power BI Report Builder. Now, if you've never used Power BI Report Builder, you can install it from the Microsoft Store. I recommend that's the way you go. Of course, it's going to open in the wrong window. So let's just move that. Let's just convince that to move across. And I never used SSRS reports. Um, so this kind of vaguely reminds me of SSRS reports. In there, we've got a data source. And in there, we've got a data set. Now, it, it's brought through the right things. And if I go and have a look at that data set and do right and data set properties, you'll see there is a whole bunch of DAX written in there, which is the DAX behind the table that we created. OK, you'd see that there's other ways of getting that out of a report if you need another method. So paginated reports, the reason people do them is it's the pixel perfect. You can lay these reports out so I can pick up that table. I can I can move it over over here on the right hand side. I can move. Um, I scroll down, there's a position, there's a location, there's a size so the location you can pick, etc. I've got a a whole set of videos. There's a whole, there's a whole set of videos I did 12 days of paginated reports. There's also a I've done a page. If you're looking for paginated report resources, I'm just going to go and find it on my hat for a data blog. Uh, if I come onto my blog and I do a search in here of paginated. Paginated report resources. Here we go. There are. A whole set of resources. Chris Finland um, used to be the, the, the Power BI person inside Microsoft that looked after paginated reports. There's a number of names there I'm sure you recognize of people who've done some excellent content on there. Cool. Um, okay, I must say that, that was amazing. If we continue like this, what a lineup. <laughs> so who wants to? I believe it's Sir Thomas is being the, the next victim. Yes. Cool. Um, let me just share my screen. And there we go. OK. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'll start my 10 minute timer right now. So the session is um, new features and SQL stuff, transact SQL functions in SQL Server 2022, which we all know came has been released publicly GA um, literally a month ago. So first of all, what I want to do is I'll just see um, and let you know that I'm running SQL Server 2022 RTM and the compatibility level of course 160 since i'm on the master database no no worries so um the functions that we will look today extremely fast so don't get too excited about um going into details are new functionalities and functions about uh, json objects so json object array is json and path um, day trunk and date bucket window function essentially window over function um greatest and least a bunch of um, bit functions. Um, there is a new updated ordinal parameter for string split, um, generate series, and a couple of first less values, ignore nulls, and um, respect nulls. Especially um, those two are very good if you are dealing with time series data. Okay, so first of all, JSON. So we can create now an array, which is just array without key pair values. So this will essentially look just, you know, like a JSON without keys, just the values. And going on further, we can see that we can, um, I'll just create a table and store these um, results right here. As you can see, I have a session ID, I have a couple of uh, values, and now I can test um, some additional functions. For instance, if this particular row is JSON. So I'm just going to run this. Um, and as you can see, the first one um, is JSON. The second, which is a just simple text, is not a JSON. 
And the third one was also not an object. So it's not an object, it's essentially array and adjacent. I'll just do a quick cleanup and we'll carry on. Um, so the object is essentially the one where you construct JSON from text from zero to essentially to a um, JSON object. So how you're going to do that is uh, by simply stating um, the keys and then getting the values out of the query. So the query, it can be essentially anything. So in this case, I will do is just store the values in the table. And you can see that now that I have my key and value, key and value. So I go from this side on. Um, and what I will do, the last one is see if test essentially um, if this particular JSON exists so that the path uh, for the JSON exists. So simply just run this. And as you can see, the first one, there is a path in the second one, which is essentially just a command. If I go back, you see that the command is just some random text. It says um, there is no path in this JSON. Okay, so there is another new functionality, which is a date trunk, uh, returns the truncated data in the same date format, um, which was the original one. What it also does, it also gives you the starting point of a particular um, date format. So essentially, if I go and say date time uh, formats two, um, and this is just a simple date stamp, um, it will always give me the first value. Um, so the truncate date time or date time two value for a given parameter, which can be year, quarter, month, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as you can see, the results are all the same. Uh, not all the same, but you know reflecting the quarter, reflecting the month, the week, and so on. But what it is important is that it will always give you the same format. The difference between date bucket and date trunk is that date bucket will only give you date time, date type in return. So date trunk always gives you the, the original date format, uh, sorry, a data format, um, whereas the date bucket uh, will uh, just give you the date time. Okay, so the next one is the window functions. So in this case, I'll just use um, AdventureWorks and I just have to see if my compatibility level is set to 160. So beforehand, what we had was, we usually had, if you want to run some um, petition, you know, some sums of a petitioned sales order or stuff like that, you would essentially just go something like this and you will get some statistics. Now with the windows class, you can define a window, uh, name it, so, um, and say what will be partitioned on and use this um, in all of this over clauses and simply just say that. So this will, um, this window functions function essentially um, sort of shortens and speeds up the results for you. But it can go a little bit further, so you can always, you know, create the second one, the third one, and so on, as you can see here. So I'm using, for instance, um, win one, saying average over this one, and then also doing the sum over this one. So it can go in different ways. So this is the window function. Then um, we have two um, great and least functions that essentially return the maximum or the minimum um, value, which can be a comma separated value. And then you will say, okay, what about min and max? Yes, it's um, sort of very similar, just to give you an idea to get the, the, the shortest, so, sorry, the biggest and the, 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 the smallest one. But there is a trick with this one because you can essentially just um, put it in um, the where class. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna go and create a table and now, if I run this command, I get the results back. And, and this uh, function, essentially, if I would be replacing it with max, we all know um, it wouldn't work. So this is, again, something which is completely um, new in Transact SQL in SQL Server 2022. And then is another one is not or is distinct from, which just compares the quality of you know, two expressions and guarantees whether it's a true or false. Um, and even um, if one or both those expressions are now also takes into the consideration. So um, again, a simple example, I'll just create a table and say 
give me everything where id is not distinct from now or i can switch back and say give me everything where um, id is distinct from uh, sorry not from now and this one is from now sorry and i can rerun that and you can see that you know in this case id would be full and i can say um, some additional value like id different from 18 um, it's not distinct from 18 and as you can see it gives you the distinct values for that as well then is the famous string split we all know this was um, introduced in 2000 so 2017 uh, but the thing was that uh, um, order was never guaranteed you know how you're gonna string split those um, values and sometimes this order can be changed so what um, they've introduced was additional parameter which um, you essentially you just say string split and you give it a one which is an argument saying if it's an null it just takes the default value otherwise you specify that you want to have this additional ordinal available and you will see that now i get some sort of a rank which i can also change from descending to let's say ascending um, so the trim functions are also something um, which was a keyword couple of keywords were added like leading trailing and both so now you can sort of trim a particular string not only with the white spaces but also uh, with a given keyword or you know word or string or something so essentially um, saying um, trim from leading where this particular word i'm looking for and sort of remove it so in this case if i just run this you will see that you know both are sort of removed from leading and trailing and both essentially takes um, left and right side sort of the same as with left trim and right trim um, then there is a couple of new um, bit um, manipulation functions like shifting bits to left shifting bits to right bit count get bit and also set bit so we all know how the bits are calculated you know so usually if we have a binary how to sort of calculate the values um, from um, bits to 10 digit numbers so this can also be very useful if you're let's say using a huge let's say in this case customer table where there is a couple of attributes and if these attributes are you know if there would be hundreds and hundreds of different attributes you can essentially just store this as a bit value and this in case would give you a new func functionality saying get bit um, so if I say get bit with an offset of four saying um, give me the value on the fourth um, position um, and it can be you know this or it can be hexadecimal string whatever um, also setting a bit saying for my value um, give me offset of four so going from zero to three um, and then saying um, give it a zero or otherwise give it um, set it to one um, and then also bit count and shifting from left to right essentially um, if you want to do some um, deep dive um, understanding and of bits or counting you can also now fairly easy um, use those functions then there is the generate series again if you're doing something alongside um, with time series data you can just say generate series from 1 to 20 you can say backwards from 50 to 1 with um, seed of 10 or vice versa going from 1 to 50 with seed of 10 and you have to be careful otherwise um, you know sometimes you might get null results essentially just because you sort of stated the wrong values and it can also use as um, decimal values I think this is the last one yeah so um, fill in the gaps um, you can st start using the gaps saying that if you are doing let's say a lot of telemetry data um, you can see for instance if there are you know some numbers um, and then there are some missing numbers um, it was always a problem you know forward feeling or backward feeling uh, the missing values or sort of just jumping over um, or saying which was the last one in the series or get none null and then fill it up so now um, this is again something that is sorted um, with 
out of the box functionality. So let's say, so this is my data, regional data voltage reading, and I can say first value. So fill it with the first value or fill it with the last value. And this comes essentially out of the box. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, feel free to follow me Twitter and GitHub or email me if you have any further questions. Thank Great you. Great stuff. Uh, so I think our next speaker is the marvelous Martin Shumby. All right, so um, I've changed the, the, the title of the session slightly, sorry about that, to be my 10 commandments of, of ETL. And I did that simply just because, you know, um, these are really the the things that I use every day um, in what I do. And, you know, I'm hoping that uh, you guys will find some value in it as as well. Um, it's essentially a an hour long presentation that's that I'm going to do in 10 minutes. So hold on to your seats and please do not blink um, because we will go very quickly. Um, this slide here is really just for uh, the sake of the recording. So I'm not going to say too much more about that, but you can find me if you want to. So with that, let's get going and get started. So number one, number one is stage your data if you are doing ETL. And, you know, there are many benefits of staging your data, and that could probably keep us busy for, you know, for at least an hour. You know, but from, from things like being able to reference the data after the fact, or being able to see the lineage of it, to not having to repeatedly extract data from your source system, you know, all of those are really good benefits um, of staging your data. So essentially extracting it and inserting it into a separate area without doing too much to it so that you can work with the data after that. Now, if you want to be one of the cool kids, you can probably call this a data stage or a data lake, if you would. Um, the concept is really still the same in the sense that you are persisting the data somewhere where you can actually work with it. Number two, be a pickpocket. Um, and so that refers to being in and out as quickly as possible. Um, in most cases, when you deal with, an e with, a, with a source system, you are going to deal with a system that is busy. There's lots of other constraints um, and requirements for resources. And so what you want to do as a general rule is you want to be in and out as quickly as you can. And, you know, if you do that successfully, for the most part, um, you will not upset too many people. Number three, configure your systems. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I still get, I get it with customers where, you know, SQL Server is installed with all the defaults in place, for instance, or you know, there's an SSIS package where nobody's taken the time to uh, configure the batch size. Every single ETL tool out there have all of these buttons that you can tweak and all of these things that you can configure to really get the best out of those systems. Um, it is your job to find out what those things are and to do those things to get the best out of the systems that you're dealing with. Um, and if you don't, you can always go and hire somebody to, to help you out with that. But configuration of your systems, both source and destination and ETL tool is a very underrated concept and, and things are many people um, just overlook these days. Number four, heaps. If you're not familiar with a heap, it's essentially a table without any, any indexes on it. Um, and in my experience, at least, and you'll see there's a little asterisk there. Um, in my experience, at least, heaps are still beneficial for the most part when you are staging your data. It's usually quicker for you to create indexes after the fact um, than it is for you to have the indexes in place when you're actually inserting the data. And the more data you insert, the more you will see that have an effect. And so in my opinion, it is still worth using heaps. I use them all the time. Um, there are some edge cases, of course, for sure. But for the most part, I use heaps. And uh, in the cases where there is an exception or I need an index, I will just do that after the insert. Number five, automate everything. I like to create my... ETL processes and, and most of what I do in such a way 
that I can automate it and just run it again. Um, and so keep that in mind when you are developing an ETL system or ETL processes, make it easy for people to run it again, develop it in such a way that you can just restart it and you don't have to handhold every part of the process every single time something goes wrong. Uh, trust me, your future self will love you if you automate as much as you possibly can. Here's one of my favorites. Too many times I see people using the wrong tool for the job. Um, and so in this case, if, uh, if the picture uh, is anything to go by, you know, maybe using whatever that device is there is not the best if you just want to dunk some Oreos in some milk. And so this translates really well into most things that we do. You know, for some things, T-SQL or SQL is going to be better. And for some other things, you know, something else might be better. But it's really worth your while to try and figure out what that is and to use the right tool for the job. Um, otherwise, your experience will definitely vary quite quite a great deal. And let's get to the next one if I can. Number seven, speed is everything. Now, if you're like me these days and you're living in a cloud-centric world and everything is cloud-based, this becomes even more important um, because speed equals money in, in today's world. Now, if you're dealing with an on-premises system, maybe that's not so much of a concern, but here's what I'd like you to think about. You deal with a system that may not have a lot of data now, and it may be very small in the scope of it. Down the line, whether it's one year, two years, or 10 years, it's probably going to grow exponentially. And so your focus in developing your ETL processes right now should be on speed. As a rule, I typically don't want anything to take longer than an hour. Um, and so if anything takes longer than that, then I usually think that's a really good use case for me to try and improve the performance. If we're not talking about a lot of data, probably a lot less than that, you know, but set your standards in such a way that you pay attention to speed from the very beginning. Otherwise, down the line, you may run into some issues where things will be out of control. Something we all love, uh, me included, is documentation. And as much as you may hate it, you know, it's always a good idea to document your work. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that you need to document it by writing 40 page documents, um, you know, but you can do simple things today that could benefit other people that may want to uh, know what you were doing or have to work on the same code as yourself. You know, when you're writing a stored proc, just provide some comments, provide a, a section at the top where you have comments and a general explanation of what you are trying to do um, and where it is feasible inside the code of your stored procedures, you can add some comments too, just to make certain things super clear. And by super clear, you know, I don't necessarily mean to add a comment that says this works and I don't know why, I actually mean that you should provide something useful, like, you know, this filter is in place because it provides this benefit or this filter is required. You know, really small things that we can add to all of our code. Annotations in, in ADF or SS, SSIS could really help other people that have to work on the code after us to, to know what we were trying to do. Number nine, plan for worst case scenarios. This is uh, something that I think comes with experience for the most part, but you know, you should always try and think about Murphy's Law when you develop these types of processes. You know, think about what can go wrong, what could people throw your way that, uh, that you didn't know about, and if you do that, it'll, it'll allow you to develop your ETL processes and, and really any processes in such a way that it could be fault tolerant to an extent. You know, I usually like to say that I'd like my code to fail gracefully. And by failing gracefully, it just means that I developed it in such a way that if something unexpected happens, that there's some way that we're dealing with it. And if you think about all of these things right in the beginning, it will probably save you a lot of time later. Number 10, learn to SQL. This is probably the only one that's really specific to the SQL Server world. 
um, of all the 10 that I've mentioned up to now. But you know, it is a good idea to learn T-SQL or at least the SQL language. Um, because if you live in a world that deals with relational databases, it's the fact that you know T-SQL or, or SQL at least is just gonna be the most efficient thing you can use for a lot of use cases. And if you don't know that, you are going to go with what you do know, and that may be something that is not as efficient or as optimized as just writing a simple SQL statement. So in my opinion, especially if you're starting out with uh, developing ETL processes, learn to SQL, it will definitely save you a bunch of time down the line. Thank you guys, appreciate it. I think my time is up and I'll hand it back over to you guys. Super tips. So uh, our last but definitely not our least speaker is uh, Melissa Coates. Over to you. All right. Thank you very much. We've got a super fast talk about security in Power BI. My top three tips. This is actually a bit of a sneak peek for the full session that we're going to do for this very same hybrid virtual group in February. So if you would like a dive three hour jam packed session on uh, security, we've got that coming soon. But first, we're going to do the lightning round, if you will. And the other thing I want to mention is that one of the things I spend a lot of time doing is some technical writing for Microsoft. And so if you have been following it all, there's a thing that we have been slowly but surely publishing called Power BI Implementation Planning. The security content is in its very final last stages of review. I would expect it's going to be out there publicly available in the next week or two at the absolute most. So wanted you to keep an eye out for that if this is a topic that you are interested in. And with that, let's jump in. My tip number one is really to know who are your users. So you really have to know who's a creator, who's a consumer in order to set up security properly. And there's shades of gray beyond data authors, report authors, and viewers or consumers. But when we're talking about our creators, we are always talking about workspace roles, member, admin, or contributor. Those are the people that have permission to write content, edit it, publish it, that sort of thing. It gets a little bit more complicated when we're talking about consumers and complicated really just because we have more options. And these are all things, of course, that we'll be able to explore in our February deep dive session. But we've got apps, there's a workspace viewer, and there is per item permissions. So really at this point, the big tip here is follow the principle of least privilege. Think about who they are and what they need. And at this point, your different groups of users and who they are and what they need, that really strongly, strongly influences how you design and organize your workspaces. All right, tip number two, set permissions for a collection of items whenever you can. And if you are thinking about folders and files in a file system, as I say this, that's exactly the point. But let's talk about it in Power BI speak, shall we? When we're talking about a collection of items, we have two ways we could attack this, workspace roles or app permissions. Workspace roles, that means Everything in the workspace, every report, every data set, et cetera, is subject to the workspace role that follows it. So if you're a member of the workspace, you can edit anything in the workspace, that sort of thing. If you have been granted permission to view an app, you get to view all of the reports in the app. That's what I mean by a collection of items. And then we've got per item permissions. We've got visuals, we've got the data layer. And essentially, all of these items, the way I think about it, when you start setting items individually, I like to think of it as we're essentially overriding the workspace security. So for instance, 
you can't view reports in the workspace, but you get uh, the per item sharing, you know, read permission on one individual report. That would be a way to override workspace roles. And that's really a good thing in certain circumstances. It just gets to be vastly overused uh, by people that do not are not necessarily experienced enough to know all of the options and when to use which one. And if we're thinking about layers of security, that collection of items, I think about that as our layer one. I think about our per item permissions as a secondary layer. And then, which we're not going to talk about in this talk, but layer three, we've got things like row level security that we can layer on to these existing items. So with that, we've said we have a collection items and we have individual items, right? So that means we have to touch on inheritance just a little bit. So let's say we've got our workspace roles set and app permissions are absolutely set separately. And that's one of the biggest advantages of them and something we will pursue in our more expanded session. But they're also sort of kind of inherited. And the reason that I say that is if you have any workspace role, if an app is published, you get to see the app. So it's separate. However, there is some level of inheritance. But we have true inheritance from all of the individual items from either the workspace roles or the apps. So my big takeaway here for you is that we can assign permissions one of several different ways, and inheritance happens one of several different ways. Tip number three, verify your security settings, particularly the inherited ones, because some of them remain what I've called tightly coupled and others are not. So let me explain to you what I mean by that. Let's say we want to have someone be able to read a report or an app, you know, all the reports that have been published to that app. But in order to be able to do that, you need, or more specifically, the report consumer needs read permission on the report itself, and they need read permission on the underlying data, both things. So that means you've experienced inheritance happening, whether or not you thought about it in that way or not. So for instance, somebody goes to share a report, it's also going to provide read on the data set underneath. And you've all seen the little check boxes of, do you want to also provide build permission, right? This also happens when you're doing app permissions, um, that sort of thing. So the takeaway that I want you to have here, though, is that those ways of setting permissions also on the underlying data set are a convenience in most cases and are not tightly coupled in most cases. So if you use a sharing link, these are all things we're going to explore more and do a demo of in the full session. If you create a sharing link, those do stay tightly coupled. If you remove that link on the report, it's going to get removed on the data set. But if you do these other types of items, like creating a uh, uh, the data set read permission when you publish an app or even direct access sharing, you can change the settings on the reports and the data set is not tightly coupled with it. So you need to get in the habit of really thinking about their managed separately. So inheritance initially happens as a convenience. And bonus tip number four, using groups whenever you can versus individual users. Now, this is a self-service BI platform. And many, many cases, we have self-service users in various business units, our really savvy analysts that are responsible for managing the content and setting the security to the content. And there's lots of things in Power BI that actually make it so that it leans more towards setting permissions for one person or one individual user more so than a group. So when your content gets to be more um, uh, important, so to speak, right, it becomes relied upon by more and more people. That means we need to do 
better practices. And groups is one of them. So in this session, we're not going to explore all the different types of groups, but really the security group or the male enabled security groups have the most coverage in Power BI in terms of how many things that we can do with them. So really what we want to do for those content creators and our consumers is think about when can we use a group uh, as opposed to one individual user, and we will save lots and lots of time and effort and efficiency because we can make the change in one and only one place. So to wrap up this, you know, really fast lightning talk about security, I will leave you with the thought that if we know who our users are and what they need and how we can go about setting security most efficiently, then what we can do is think about what are our different audiences, what are their different needs, and basically try to balance user flexibility, risk reduction, and efficiency. All right, that's it for me and my whirlwind top three tips and a bonus tip that I had to sneak in there. Great. I will definitely try this out and I urge everybody to get your security lined up so you know what you want to do uh, because you don't have time to figure that out during Melissa's session uh, February 22nd. That's perfect. And I hopefully everyone has now seen in chat the instructions for the end of year quizzes. We've got a few people that have come in there. It's also worth saying that uh, since last year's champion, uh, Reitzer, or Riser, I'm not, not sure how you say that, um, yep. uh, is not on the call today. He can't, he, can't, um, he can't retain his championship. And it arguably, as you know, Mikel, it was a controversial uh, win. Um, we have Ed, who came second on the call. So um, Ed is the man to beat uh, for everyone. So I don't know how much longer. I don't think all our speakers have joined yet. Thomas, why are you not on there? Melissa, I'm not sure you're on there yet. Joining now, sorry. Uh, it says you're in. See your nickname on screen, question mark, but I don't see a way to oh. say yep, okay. No, exactly. I think uh, that starts when Mark clicks his stuff. Okay. Okay. I hope so, because I am stuck at the same screen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've not, I've not clicked start yet. Maybe I should. Shall I click start? In fact, I'll tell you what. I'll share. Let me share my screen so everyone can see where we're. Share the um, answers. Oh. Answers, Mark. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Three, two. Okay, so the first round is going to be about community questions, so event-related technology event questions. Let's get going. Which city did SQL Bits visit in 2010 for SQL Bits 7? So we've got Brighton, York, London or Cardiff. Last person's going to miss it. There we go. Oh, there must be another couple of people. Uh, and it was, of course, York. This was actually my very first speaking gig. Um, uh, yeah. Let's move on. So eight people got that. Whoa, no, sorry, tell a lie. Three people got that right. And Haida. <laughs> Haida, you're in front. So Ed was fourth there, the champ. Which city did not host the short-lived sequel rally events? Was it Dallas? Was it Barcelona? Was it Orlando? Or was it Copenhagen? My claim to fame is I think I'm the only person from Europe to speak at both of the US ones, if there's a clue there. And yeah, it was, of course, Barcelona. I'm a 12th, 12th place, oh dear. sharing place with Ed with zero points. Still. We've got three. Well, we've got three of our speakers <laughs> that are in the leaderboard, which is good. Mm. Not um, <laughs> Bum luck. <laughs> I'm beating the same answer every time, by the way. 
So this is a good one. It is famous. Developers, developers, developers speech. How many times did Steve Barmer shout, developers? Was it four? Was it seven? Was it 20? Or was it 14? And this is basically what I counted on YouTube. I may have got the count wrong. A very sweaty Steve Barmer. And I counted 14. So six people. Who got that one right? Wow. Ida is going for the win. Melissa's coming up. So prior to the de demise of the original PASS organization, what was the size of membership of this group? You told me this once, but I ignored no, I, you. Yeah. So I it was know. approximately 6,000 or <laughs> 60 or 600 or 60,000. I should learn not to ignore you when you talk, Mark. So a clue for the last person to answer. One of them's a ridiculous answer. Only one. <laughs> <laughs> so incredibly, it was 6,000. I suspect that we had... Um, 5,999 inactive members, though. Um, right, swiftly moving on. Melissa is top. Ida, luck. come on. Total luck. And um, the rest of our speakers are off the leaderboard. That's not good. So Nobody meta... could believe you had 6,000 people in your group. No, well, um, <laughs> as some of those would have been our legacy people from the, the old Oracle um group that we 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 derived from did you did you use distinct count or just count <laughs> it was just counts <laughs> yeah maybe that's where we were going wrong which technical event does this logo belong to so it's called the data monster live 360 gof of con docker con or sql conference As my, my daughter said to me last night, she said, Daddy, SQL conference is spelt wrong. And I explained it was because it was a German event. Yeah, SQL conference, great event. Melissa is still, wow. Melissa is, is making oh, a massive That's the only lead, one uh, that wasn't a complete guess. So I got to <laughs> I got to tell you, it's the only one that was more of an educated, I think. Yes, more than a random. <laughs> you can choose my lottery numbers, Melissa, for uh, All right. weekend. Okay, so, oh, Swedham, we're, we're catching up. Yes. What animal is the official mascot of this group? Is it the koala? Is it the platypus? Is it an elephant or is it the liger? The picture is not of the animal. Not any animal. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a clue. The picture is neither of these. Hmm. I thought I got a cheat code here. You, if you get this one wrong, Mikkel, I won't be very happy with you. <laughs> and yes, platypus. So the the liger was the trick question there because that's the one you thought it probably should be. We only tricked two people. And Thomas, you're back in it. So I'm glad um, Swedham is, is up there because I kept, I don't know if you remember, Mikkel, I was having a go at you a lot last uh, last year because you had visibility to all the answers and were leading for most of the, the quiz. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the Azure icons round. I should quickly oh. point out I use the word service when some of them, strictly speaking, aren't services. So which graphic does it belong to? So what is this graphic? Is it an event grid? Is it bot framework? Is it logic apps? Or is it Azure IoT Hub? <sighs> and it is, of course, the bot framework. I say of course, but I would have probably got that wrong. <laughs> bot framework. Let me see if I can get up um, the... Um, <laughs> Your cheat <full>, account. <laughs> no, oh, not cheat account. I wanted to get see if I could get the full leaderboard up. Um, although my... Oh, here we go. Kahoot. I think it's in reports, isn't it? And if I can't, reports. 
So I think it'd be interesting to see where everyone else is. But while I'm doing that, let's go to the next question. So next icon. So what is this? Is it a blockchain service, Databricks, Kubernetes or BizTalk services? And, and yes, blockchain. But if that was blockchain, Mark. It's a blockchain. It's, it's not so a blockchain. I don't know ah, there what you a go. That's, that's, a, um, that's version two, that is blockchain. <laughs> I think the, um, hasn't the chain split a few too many times to get that? I don't know. Um, so, right. So okay, that's let's... why we got the wrong answer. Right. Let's see if we can take a quick look at. Um, uh, how do I do this? Anyone? Maybe I should have practiced this a bit more. Click on players. That's Here my guess. Go. So, Martin, you're doing terribly there. That's I'm not sure unexpected. anyone's going to be able to believe really? me, beat Melissa you're at all. Really, you're doing really well compared to me. Yeah. Right, moving on. Name the Azure service again. What is this? Data Cube, Auto Manage, Rubik's Cube service, or Container Registry? One of those is a silly answer. Hopefully, you can guess. Are, are you going to do this part next year? Because I'm considering doing a bot with image recognition and click functionality. <laughs> Um, yeah, we could do that. Huh. I'd be interested to see you do that, Mikhail. I have auto manage. Minions. I have minions for that. That's true, you do. <laughs> Who has heard of auto manage? So nobody. I'm not yeah. sure what it's auto managing. I'm sure Melissa knows. Do you know Melissa? No earthly idea. All right. Name the Azure service. Is it Jumbo SQL? <laughs> Is it Postgres SQL? Cassandra or MySQL? Interestingly, my daughter didn't understand the jumbo connotation, so I had to do a Google for that to explain it. And uh, I understand now this is a an age thing. Apparently, there's a, a big elephant called jumbo. Yeah. Back in the day. Um, yeah, so most people got that one right. Who sighed there? You didn't get that wrong, did you, Melissa? I did. I was like, which one, which one, which one? It's one of Did you do two. Jumbo? <laughs> I did my sequel, and then I and uh, then I questioned it. As soon as I clicked it, I'm like, I... So, yeah, I'm about to lose my lead to Anthony. Okay. Name these. Your service. There's only a few more of these, I think. Is this availability set? Is it an Azure stack? Is it Azure artifacts, or is it Azure boards? Way to pick the weird ones, Mark. <laughs> yeah, the services nobody's ever heard of. Yeah. And yes, it's Azure Artifacts. It's um, the icon within Azure DevOps that you'll see that. Um, yeah, it's actually the, the, the part of DevOps that not many people tend to use, but you store software, software within that for deployments, apparently. Um, okay, so oh, wow, Anthony, you are now top potential champion material. Okay. Drag. What? Sorry, yeah. So is this the um formerly icon formerly known as Prince? Is your bastion code spaces or machine learning? And interestingly, no one got the red answer. It was the wrong color for that. <laughs> Anthony is doing pretty darn well. Nick is on the rise, I see. Anthony Melissa, I think you've fire. had your day. Right, 
Right, so what's this one? Is it Azure Automation? Is it Azure Maps? Is it Azure Federation Services? Or is it Cosmos DB? One of these answers does not even exist. And it is, of course, Azure Maps. Oh. Jojo is on the rise. Speakers are not doing too well here. So what's this one? I think this is the last icon. So is this Digital Twins? Is it IoT Edge? Is it Migrate? Or is it as your policy? And while you're clicking away there, let me just get the leaderboard. Um, here and yeah of course the answer is digital twins just in a refresh on the full leaderboard so anthony is smashing it and uh, laura this is not good enough uh, last year's um, runner-up, Ed. 10. You're really not doing well this year, Ed. Oh, so I suppose, yeah, I suppose that's true. Um, and, of course, my Mr. Matthew account is bottom because I've not tried answering anything yet. Okay, cool. So, I think we go to another round now, and I think it may be general knowledge, if I remember correctly. But everything you didn't need to know coming up. What was Hong Kong Fui's real name? Was it Harry? Was it Penry? Was it Henry? Or was it Eric? <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> You've now put that tune in my head, Mark. Yeah, well, everyone gets this one wrong because everyone mis misheard what, uh, what he says at the beginning of this cartoon. And it is, of course, Penry. But it sounds very much like Henry. And Swedham on the rise. What name did Dustin name his pet demagogue in Stranger Things Season 2? Was it Thor? Did he never name it? Was it D'Artagnan or was it Spike? And it was, oh, that's wrong. Oh, yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, quiz, the quiz is cancelled. No, um, I don't know. Out, I don't know how I have marked the wrong answer here, but it was actually, oh, in fact, we had five people. Um, so okay. post in chat if you were one of those five people, and we can give you bonus points, but it should have been D'Artagnan. Um, two points. Thought, two points, yeah. Sorry about that. That's a massive fail, isn't it, Mikel? Yep. So name this film. Is it Sharknado 3? Oh, hell no. Sharknado 5, <laughs> Global Swarming. Is it Sharknado or is it Sharknado The Fourth Awakens? I hope we have marked the right answer for this. I don't, I don't see any Google. sharks. Will Max Mark pick the questions? Yeah, I think next year, can we, can we have somebody else? So, Fourth Awakens is correct. <laughs> and I think, well done to Anthony there. It looks like he got that right. And Jojo on the rise. What was the Super Nintendo Entertainment System known as? In Japan, was it the Super Famicom? Was it Dreamcast? Was it the Mega Drive? Or was it the SNES? And it was obviously the Super Famicom. Oh, obviously. Oh, obviously. Well, <laughs> obvious for some of us. I will let you know that code has run out of uh, 
run out of nice things to say to me. <laughs> right. Okay. So Anthony is absolutely smashing it this year. What was the first music video aired on MTV? Was it Money for Nothing by Dire Straits, Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles, Or Some oh, Sugar on Me by so Def Leppard, or You Better Run by Pat Benatar? Oh, man. Somebody else does next year's quiz, okay? <laughs> that feels like the kind of thing I should know. You absolutely should. But so it's a surprising it's answer. Yeah. No cookie it is a surprising you. answer. So, Mikkel, are you going to sing a bit bit of that for us? Or no. no? Oh, Sorry. Okay. My computer said no cookie for you. <laughs> okay, <fair> so <laughs> I'm sad. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, I had that 10 answers ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Anthony, I think, got that one. Oh, did he? No, three in a row. Wow. Laura, what, wasn't you, like, second to last just now? So what tree does aspirin come from? Is it the Sharinga? Is it the oak? Is it the willow? Or is it the pine? I thought it was the pill tree. On farmer tree. Oh, that's, that, that's making sense, of course. And it's the willow. This was a question my daughter gave me, so you have to blame her if you don't like it. That question was really good. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let to know. Laura, Laura, wow! What? Oh, that was your idea. Melissa, could do, Laura, could the speakers, Swedham. Um, I'll never live this down if Swedham uh, wins this one. But Anthony, you're um, keeping top spot for now. You've got Nick as well. He's um, staying in there. So we move on to technology. Given that I don't know much about tech, this is not going to be good. What is the code name for Secret Server 2022? Is it Seattle, Nairobi, Dallas, or Helsinki? And the clue is in the picture. So there's a there's a bit of a cheat for Melissa. Is it for Melissa? She's from Finland. <laughs> <laughs> Right, oh, yes, yeah, so it is Dallas. Yeah. Oh. I only knew that after looking it up. Okay. Which of these is not a valid licensing type in Power BI? Premium by capacity, premium by user, Power BI Pro, or <laughs> premium by workspace? You should have had get paid for using it. Premium by workspace. Although well, you never know, that might be coming sometime. Who knows? So, yeah. Good stuff. Martin S., well done. We finally a category that I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> 2022, Microsoft released a new infrastructure's code syntax known as Tricep. True or false? So I can say we had arm, we had bicep, did we have tricep? And of course we didn't. Although, who knows, maybe it's on the horizon. Well, Anthony is doing well here. And Melissa, you're still doing well. Good to see. Oh, Ed's starting to make a comeback now. What was the previous name for Azure Cosmos DB for NoSQL API? Was it Graph API? Was it SQL API? Was it NoSQL API? Or was it MySQL API? And here's a clue. It's the, the answer you almost expect it not to be. My cat's scratching away, so if you can hear that, apologies. Yeah, so interestingly, it was actually SQL API. Uh, just to confuse everybody. Right. Um, no change on the leaderboard there. Which of these is not a compute type of the Azure Machine Learning Service? 
Is it dynamic compute, compute instance, attach, co attach computes, or inference cluster? And of course, dynamic compute is not one of those. Let's see what we got. And I'm just a quick check on the um, whole leaderboard. Oh, still refreshing. Here we go. And who's towards the bottom? Um, LC and Wolf need to do better. Um, there's not a huge gap, though. To the top, you could still get a respectable position. Um, okay. What was the original name for Azure? So we actually had an answer that told you this in the last year's quiz. Was it Blue Cat? Was it Redstone? Was it Aurora? Or would it have been Red Dog? And um, that is quite surprising. So Aurora, no. Uh, Project Red Dog was the answer. Huh. Um, you should have got that one right, Laura. You obviously weren't listening last year, were you? I didn't um, get that one right. <laughs> oh, you did? Yes. Oh, okay. My apologies. Um, Ed is on the climb. I have though. to confess, but I did get it right. Oh, good stuff. Well done. In 1996, what did Sybase rename their database server to avoid confusion with Microsoft SQL Server products on the Windows platform? Was it Sybase, Adaptive SQL, Adaptive Server Enterprise, DBase, or was it MySQL? And yeah, A-S-E it was, in fact. Low movement there, which is um, interesting. Okay, so we're going into the last um, part of the quiz now, the Christmas round. So what is commonly eaten by the Japanese on Christmas Day? Is it turkey sushi rolls, fried chicken, pizza, or parsnip miso soup? And it is, surprisingly, KFC or fried chicken. Uh, if you don't believe me, Google it. Ed, you can still do this. So what is the name of the Grinch's dog? Is it Teddy? Is it Stuart? Is it Rover? Or is it Max? And it's Max. Eight people got that one right. Okay. Nick's back up on the leaderboards. What were the names of the two burglars in the film Home Alone? Was it Harry and Marv, Hugh and Merle, Henry and Merv, or Henry and Marv? I've never seen Home Alone. Yes. One day, perhaps. Harry and Marv. Oh, Anthony's on fire. Ed is pushing for the winner slot, though. Two more questions, Ed. You've got to get them right. Or three more. What was the first song played in space? Was it Jingle Bells? Was it White Christmas? Was it Baby, It's Cold Outside? Or was it Silent Night? 
This is the first song ever to have been played in schools. I would guess Major Tom. <laughs> That'd be cool. So thankfully I did tick the right uh, answer here. It was in fact Jingle Bells for some strange reason. This might be why we've never seen aliens. <laughs> And it looks like Melissa's definitely going to bag a top five slot. Swedham, you're starting to fall. Ed, this is going to be make or break for you now. What year could you have first received a Rubik's Cube for Christmas? Could it have been 1984, 1980. If I had to guess, I would have said 82 or 81 personally, maybe even 83. That's when I remember them in the shops. Mm. Well, Anthony, I think you may have this sewn up. Final question, right? Oh, yeah, final question. You've got 10 seconds for this. Is Gremlins a Christmas movie? Yes or no? True or false? Double points. And of course it is. Um, does, does Ed agree with this one? Uh, let me see. Uh, Ed, tell me, do you agree with this one? <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll take that at least it, you know, Seems more Christmassy than than Die Hard. How about that? <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you that. So, unfortunately, though, Ed, you did not make the winner slot. But well done to Melissa, who made third place, and yourself, Ed, who again uh, always a runner up. And of course, it is Anthony who wins and becomes the Hybrid Virtual Group Quiz Ball Champion in twenty twenty two. Um, no. Anthony, I don't know whether uh, you want to ping us um, uh, on chat uh, or I, I don't know. How do we do this, Mikhail? Because if we manage to get a prize, we could send him something. Um, but we don't currently have a prize. Um, but... No, he, he'll have to find us when we are at the conference or something. That's, yeah. OK, do that. Um... We'll buy you a beer, Anthony. Yes. Um, although we're going to get about 500 people now, Mikkel, saying yeah, their I'm name's Anthony. Anthony and they want to be here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, that wraps up our uh, end of year Christmas quiz. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for their brilliant lightning talks. And, and thank you for everyone else for joining us.